Okay, well, hello, lovely listeners. Um, today, I'm going to be having a conversation with David Gomes. David is a coach. He helps people become who they secretly long to be through the ancient wisdom of mindfulness um, and the effectiveness of contemporary coaching. Uh, David's been referred to as a, a practical thinker, a sounding board, and the mindfulness guy, and provides refreshing, fresh perspectives He's a self-confessed enemy of the status quo. Quite interested to know what you mean by that. And, um, and a believer in people's dreams and never gives up on people or any, any ideas at all. David's journey really became from being dissatisfied with his own life, despite of what he'd already achieved in experience. And that unhappiness led him on a search. And as he says, when the student is ready, the teacher arrives. And that's what happened in David's case. So... David, thank you so much for being here today. I, I'm excited to have a, a conversation with you. Welcome. Yeah, thanks, Mel. It's, it's a delight to be here. And through the miracle of the internet. Yes, indeed. Walking across the pond. And are you still in Vancouver, Canada? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we just had we just had a big dump of snow here. It's the, the weather's gotten quite unpredictable, but it all melted and went away, so... And how is life over there? It's um, it can be quite strict in some areas of Canada, I believe. Yeah, I think like many countries, we've we've had um, another, you know, yet another wave, and um, but we're, we're we're pretty highly vaccinated country. So sorry, I just have to let my dog in. As I said, come on, okay, come on in, old timer. We're a pretty vaccinated country, and um, you know. <clears throat> We just, I just try and go about my business, but I've been working at home for so many years that in, in one sense, the pandemic, I have a different relationship to it than most people. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as someone wisely said, we're all in the same storm, but we don't have the same boat. So there's a, there's a whole host of different kind of experiences that people are, are going through, you know, but um, we're, we're managing okay here. Okay, cool. <laughs> Um, well, David, um, I always love to know more about the sort of backstory of my guests and, you know, what led you to where you are now and what led you into coaching and, and um, yeah, just, just a bit more background on you and you talked about the unhappiness all those years ago and, and obviously you were doing something at the time that wasn't fulfilling you, so just love to know a bit more about you. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I came... I actually was, when I was a young man, I was a hairdresser and I actually studied at Vidal Sassoon's in London. So this right. was back in the early eighties. And, um, you know, I worked at a very successful salon, uh, you know, it was internationally renowned. Um, and, you know, one day I was introduced to a, a new person who had started and he was regaling me with these sort of metaphysical stories and yogis. And this is way before the internet, right? So, I mean, I had no kind of concept of, of any of these sort of things. I wasn't really into personal development. You know, I just had my head down and I was just doing what everyone else did. Um, but this, this fellow piqued my interest. And one day he, he brought a, a book into me to read and that, that book changed my life in a heartbeat. Um, and I've been on that path ever since. And so, even though I, I came to coaching very late in life, I was 47 when I decided to actually become a coach, but I've been mentoring people for years because of my own kind of spiritual practices. And um, so I know what it's like to make difficult transformations, you know, as, especially in middle age, um, it's much more difficult, but um, I was a filmmaker and I was involved in the entertainment business. And, you know, I, I just sort of had a midlife crisis and I just thought you know I really want to get back to working with people and less technology and more one-on-one -on -one. and you know I thought to myself what, what can I do how can I use my gifts and many people had said you should be a psychologist or a psychiatrist and I thought no and coaching was kind of personal coaching was kind of emerging and I thought you know this might be something I could get behind so I took all the training and um you know, I hung my hat out and um, it's been incredibly challenging and incredibly rewarding uh, because you get an intimate peek into people's lives and you're 
you're journeying with them. You're trying to assist them and grow with them and travel with them. Um, so, you know, I think it's just, we've lost touch with this idea of having mentors and coaches and teachers in our lives. A lot of people sort of, they feel like they have to do everything by themselves, right? And they're sort of living in these little quiet lives of desperation. And the truth is, you know, it's much easier sometimes to, to journey with someone to get help, to get support, to get assistance. Um, not because you're broken or there's anything wrong, but just because we all get stuck and we all need fresh perspectives. So that's kind of how I, I came to this work. You know, I, I did come to it quite late in life. So, so you were a hairdresser and when you said you worked in film and entertainment, was that as a hairdresser or was that something different? No, I was making films. Yeah, I was, I started out in the commercial business, which was, you know, pretty soulless. Um, and then I thought, well, you know, if I've got to be in the film business, what's the most interesting thing? The most interesting thing was actually being a filmmaker. So I got into directing and I directed a feature film. Uh, but um, that lifestyle was very relentless. And, you know, what can I say? Like, you, you can only make sense of your life looking back at it. <laughs> at the time, sometimes things don't make sense. So now I realize the things that I was doing they were all leading me to this, this final stage of sort of the work I'm doing now. Uh, in hairdressing, you develop the skill to listen very deeply. You're intimately acquainted with people. You know, oftentimes you're, you're having long relationships with people. Um, mm -hmm. In filmmaking, you're telling stories. Um, you're trying to understand stories. And really coaching is about helping people to tell themselves better stories. So um, yeah, I always knew that at some point in my life, I was gonna find what it was that I was destined to do. And I'm a late bloomer, so I didn't find that till late, but um, you know, that's kind of how it played out. How did you go from hairdressing to filmmaker? It doesn't seem like a natural transition. Well, when you're a hairdresser, especially working at the kind of place I was working at, you, you meet a huge variety of people, you know, so you have access to people that you probably wouldn't meet ordinarily. Um, so I, I just had a, you know, I had, a, you know, back in the day, I had a big Rolodex. I knew a lot of people doing a lot of interesting things. I knew people in the, in the business and I started out in the commercial business. I started out as a production assistant. So I was about as low as you can get. You know, I'm, I was the guy that was bossed around and go get me coffee and directors screaming at you and and I worked my way up, you know, and, and then I just, I was self taught, you know, I just taught myself to write and I taught myself to direct and um, I had a burning desire, it took me a decade to, to fulfill this and so I understand what it's like as a coach to have a burning desire. I understand what it's like to be up against the odds. Make, making films is incredibly challenging and difficult. And so I think that is a gift I bring to my clients because I'm, I'm relentless. I never give up on people, on ideas. Um, and, you know, that's required in this material world. So the question is, what, what do you want to focus your life on? What do you care about? You know, what, what's, what's at the core of your being? And um, sometimes that's a job, sometimes it's not, but it's worth exploring, you know, because we're, we, we live in this mystery. <laughs> we're born into this mystery. You know, we do a bunch of stuff into this mystery and then we dissolve into some other mystery. And so, you know, my coaching has a, you know, uh, it has a spiritual element to it, right? Because if you, it doesn't take long to sort of figure out that we're in this very interesting, curious mystery. We have these bodies in time and space. What are we going to do with this brief, you know, moment in, in, in eternity? And so, you know, um, I'm very passionate about this work. So I think there's a lot of people out there that are, especially today, the cracks in our society have been revealed. And, you know, I think there's a lot of people that are really quietly suffering and, um, they need support and they need help. And I, I've seen miraculous things happen through people becoming more mindful, people becoming more on purpose, people understanding their values, putting their lives in a spiritual perspective. I've seen miraculous things happen. So, you know, it, it, that is something I really care about. 
So in terms of, um, you say you're a late bloomer. I mean, it sounds like we're a similar age because I started my coaching last year, uh, which would have been at 47. Um, and I think I've always classed myself as a late developer as well. I sort of, I got into being in a band when I was 23, which was probably quite late. Um, I dabbled a bit before then. Um, but yeah, everything I seem to have, anything that's has really got purpose or really meant something seems to have come much later than other people. Mm. So I'm, I'm intrigued to know how you went from being in the film making business to, um, I know Yogi Ananda um, is your guru and you, but, but you were introduced to, to him back in when you were hairdressing, I think you said. So, yeah. so you, you had, a, you did the hairdressing, you met some amazing people, you had a burning desire to be a filmmaker, you fulfilled that. And what happened in between them? Because you've gone from that to, to being a coach. What was, what was, was there something in between that as well? Um, because you talked about in your bio about, you know, never being particularly satisfied or realizing you weren't satisfied and, and wanting to live from purpose more. So how did that look? Did, was there, was there more to the journey between the film and the coaching? Not really. I mean, you know, I was just, I was pretty burnt out from the film business. It'd been a very difficult decade and um, I, I was tired, you know, I was tired and I was weary and I, I didn't want to continue. I was just very tired of the lifestyle. I didn't like it. Um, it didn't align with my values. And so, you know, I had to have a long, hard look at myself and figure out like, what, what are my gifts? What are my talents? Like, what do I care about? What do I enjoy doing? What, when am I at my best? And, you know, I was fortunate to sort of discover a coaching school that, um, that sort of was in alignment with my, my, my values. And I just jumped into it. I mean, I, it was literally, you know, I don't know how else to say it. It's like jumping off a cliff. I mean, you know, and I had a, I had a home and a mortgage and a, you know, I have a wife. And so it was, it was a very challenging time because, you know, back when I started, I mean, even today, a lot of people don't understand personal coaches. It's very common for Olympic athletes and musicians and CEOs. And like, there are people that are achieve high levels of things. They all have coaches. But the ordinary person thinks a personal coach, I mean, that's not for me. Like I have to solve my own problems. So, but back when I started, I mean, it was even more difficult to sort of explain what it was, but um, I just realized that this was my life's calling. This is what I was going to do for the rest of my life. What I meant in the bio is that <clears throat> most people don't come to what I would call some sort of a realization because good things are happening consistently to them. It's through suffering, it's through problems, it's through illness, it's through loss that people wake up and go, what's the purpose of my life? Who am I? And how do I want to be in relationship to my life? And so that was the same for me. It's not, it's not when things are going perfect that people, then they tend to be in their ego. So, um, you know, looking back at all was a very kind of natural but invisible evolution to this kind of work, you know, I was somehow drawn to it at the right time. And um, you never know what the right time is, right? As a late bloomer, <laughs> you, you have to give up all the concepts that are being sold out there that, you know, there's some really easy, simple trajectory. It didn't work that way for me. No, no, I don't think it works that way for many people. Um, I, don't, I don't think so either. <laughs> you, you talked about, um, <clears throat> before coaching you were already like a mentor spiritual mentor what did you mean by that well you know when you're a hairdresser you're meeting a lot of people and it's quite an intimate job um you know again as i said i was working at this you know this very celebrated place um and and i was engaged in this spiritual practice that was you know um at the time, there's a there's a lot more understanding of this stuff now. But again, at the time, it was still, you know, people were curious. I had changed my lifestyle kind of changed overnight, you know, mm. went from being sort of this type of person to a completely different human being. 
literally overnight. So obviously people were curious and um, they would bring problems to me as, and you know, they, they just seemed to want to talk about their problems and their struggles. And I would always put it into a context that was sort of interesting for them. So I think they were drawn to the, to the ideas that I was exploring myself. Um, you know, we, we underestimate the power of a good conversation. Yeah, totally agree with that. Yeah, and also, you know, vulnerability, uh, it's something that um, I've noticed in my own life, but I've noticed with, with clients as well, if you're willing to be vulnerable with that person, then it's very rare that they don't open up back to you um, because they feel safe um and there's not enough of that you know like you you mentioned earlier about the egos when everything's great you know the egos in place or whatever and you don't you're not looking for change because everything's great but that's not most people's reality um we all have our challenges and to have the gift of being able to listen to somebody and be open and impart your wisdom and I guess there's a vulnerability in, in doing that especially if you so dramatically changed almost overnight in terms of the person you were um that must have been quite um I don't know that must have been quite scary to begin with was it <laughs> scary for my parents and other people who knew me <laughs> yeah yeah they thought I joined a cult so yeah yeah I've had that one as well yeah <clears throat> yeah yeah I, I mean you know there are two ways to change anything, right? You can focus on external change. That's valuable, right? Maybe you need to change your job, change your relationship, change where you live, uh, you know, redecorate. There's all kinds of external things. Most people focus completely on externals. So in the wisdom traditions, we don't say that isn't important, but we focus on the foundation, which is our relationship inside of ourselves mm. um and you know the spiritual life a lot of people don't they don't have a relationship to that idea they don't know how to process it they don't want traditional religions but it's really just a skillful way of living and involves different techniques such as meditation and mindfulness um, these are not new things they're ancient things they're wise things and they work and so what I'm trying to explain to people is that it's, it, it's, a, it's a combination of inner work and then reflecting that in your outer world. You, you need both. And this is why a lot of coaching is ineffective because it's, um, it ends up sort of being a boot camp or uh, rah, rah, rah. And so you have to get to the roots of things. You have to get to the foundations of things. Um, and mindfulness is one of these kind of practices that, that if you start to use it, um, it will def definitely change your outer circumstance because you will start to look at the world in a new way. You'll start to think in a new way. And um, this is why I have combined coaching with mindfulness. They're both you know, required to create real transformation. And we all want the same things. We want to be happy, mm -hmm. we want to feel contented. We want a life that makes sense to us. We want a life that feels valuable. We want to be of service. Whether people realize it or not, this is these are eternal truths. They're in our DNA. And so, you know, where do you go to find these conversations? Where do you go to sort of do this kind of work? You know, if you don't want to go to a regular church, and you, 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 how, how do you find someone to help you navigate through these big questions, you know? That was sort of how I came at this work, because I, I felt like there was a real need for this, but people couldn't, they couldn't quite define what the need was, but there was a thirst. So who, who, who are your sort of clients? Do you have, <clears throat> could it be anyone and everything? Do you have a certain person that tends to be attracted to you? Where do you find these, these clients and what's the sort of work that you do with them? Well, it, it's um, 
generally speaking, I tend to work with sort of an older demographic. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, it's probably 35 and up. It's very rare that I work with younger people, but I'm currently working with some very young people. You know, I mean, like people in their 20s, but that's rare. Um, usually people in coaching come with a, some sort of a presenting issue. They, they come with a low hanging fruit, <clears throat> uh, the obvious problem. I don't like my job or, you know, uh, it could be anything from a corporate executive who wants to be an entrepreneur to a, you know, entrepreneur who wants to, you know, go to the next level to someone who doesn't like their job. It could be almost anything relationships. So, in one sense, the issue is just the content, right? It's the content of your life and the content is always changing. And so most people are just, they, they see life like a chessboard. It's like, I'll move the pieces around. And if I get all the pieces moved around in just the right way, I'll be happy. Mm -hmm. And so underneath it all, everyone is seeking the same thing. They, they, when you want something to be different in your life, what you're really saying is I want to feel differently. And if you really want to feel different, what would you have to believe? You'd have to believe something different. So when you change a belief, you change your identity. <laughs> and when you change your identity, that, that can be a hard sell, right? When I found my teacher, I changed my identity. It wasn't, it was just, I found something that was so radically different from what I was doing before. My identity had to change. And so this is underneath it, what all people are seeking. There's a there's a lot of marketing and coaching and I get it that people love to niche out and say, you know, I'm a, I, I coach dentists and I, I coach executives or, but underneath it all, whether I'm working with an executive or a student going to Columbia university, there, there's a core thing that all humans are seeking. Uh, they want a nice life outside, but they also want to feel good in their head. Yeah. That's pretty universal. You know, I've never known that not to be true. So people aren't coming to me because they want like a second Ferrari. Like I don't work with those kind of people, right? And the people that a lot of the people I work with are they already have an amazing lifestyle. So they're not they're not coming to find more money. They're coming to find more purpose, more meaning, and to learn things like mindfulness, meditation, presence. You know, they want to improve and. Uh, enrich their lives okay you want to go out there you go. see i wasn't kidding when i said yeah. my dog <laughs> it reminds me of my cat yeah <laughs> yeah so that's kind of you know uh, it, it's a hard question to answer i mean i do have just people all over the map you know yeah okay and so so if somebody was going to work with you what does it look like you, you talk about mindfulness and obviously there's the, the coaching element so I'm guessing it's sort of one-on-one -on -one sessions, um, whether in person or remote or whatever, but just give us a sort of overview of, of what people could expect if they wanted to work with you. Yeah, generally they'd come to my website. Uh, they'd be curious about some of the things, you know, there's a ton of testimonials on there. Um, they book a free session. You know, I offer a complimentary session um where i you know i do a little bit of uh intake so they they answer a few questions for me so i understand a little bit about where they're at I have a conversation see if it uh if we connect and if i feel i can help them um and a lot of times honestly like it's pretty instantaneous people literally hire me after the call some people like to you know think things through and um and from that perspective, you know, I work long term with people, so I don't I don't just do individual sessions. So the minimum amount is three months. And so within that three months, you know, we start off with a, what I would call a deep dive discovery. You know, we have to figure out <clears throat> we need to get our map and our compass and we're going to go on a journey. So before we go, we need to figure out where are we? How do we get to this place? Where do we think we want to go? How fast do we want to go? <laughs> what do we need to take with us? So that's always sort of stage one. Um, and then from there, you know, it's a, it's a process. Um, and the mindfulness is sort of, it's baked into everything. Um, so, and I have a complete sort of online system. So I use a lot of technology in my work too. So um, 
you know, it's a, what I'm trying to create is a very supportive ecosystem. And they kind of step into this ecosystem. It's got all these tools and support. And yeah, I do one-on-one -on -one work, mostly on the phone, because um, I work with a lot of people who don't live in Canada even. Um, and, you know, it's both highly structured and highly intuitive, depending on the person, the, you know, what, what they're wanting to explore. Um, so that, that's kind of generally how it works. And then, you know, I'm, I'm meeting very regularly with my clients. So usually once a week. Yeah. Uh, then I have long-term clients that I'm mentoring, you know, people I've worked with for, you know, a long time. I have clients I've worked with for a de over a decade. So, and they, you know, we have a different relationship. They're more just coming for regular support. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, coaching's fun. I mean, it's a, it's a fun process too. It's enjoyable. Like people start to, they start to realize that, that they're more than they thought they were. They can accomplish more. They can be more. They can feel more. They can, you know, um, and they've got someone in their life who's encouraging, who's supporting, who's not a friend, not your wife, not your, your husband, not your boss. It's a completely different relationship. And it's quite satisfying mm. because it's focused on you. You know, um, so most people, when they try coaching, really like it. And some people don't because they're not, they're not ready to really make a move. Yeah. You know? They're not ready to do the work. Fair enough. The coaching will reveal that too, right? If you're not ready to reveal the, you know, to do the work, you'll, the coaching will absolutely show you that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's kind of how it works. So would you say that you have definitely now found your purpose and this is it, or do you think there's more, more variety for you to come? Oh, there's more variety, but it's, it, it's in this ecosystem of my values. Um, you know, I, I'm collaborating now. I'm in, you know, I'm in the phase of my life now where I'm also collaborating with other entities. So I'm collaborating with other organizations um, that are interesting to me. Um, I'm doing more teaching online uh, and developing more sort of resources and courses. So because the one-on-one -on -one work is more expensive. There's only so much of it I can do. So it becomes kind of a top tier thing. So I'm trying to create ways that I can sort of push out this, this wisdom, practical wisdom mm. in a way that more people can access it. So, you know, we're always evolving, but um, yeah, this is it for me. You know, this is, everybody has to make a living. Like everyone has to get paid and we're all paying people to do things for us. That's just how life works. Right. Yeah. And, um, but aside from being paid, I feel like my job is of service to people. I'm, I'm improving the world. I'm improving people's lives. I'm helping and supporting. I'm trying to be in service. That's that, that's my goal. And it's part of my spiritual life, right? Like life is service. And, as long as you're breathing the free air of earth, you're required to do something with this body. And I just wanted to do something that felt good, that I felt was really improving the world in some way, you know? Um, and so I really can't think of anything else I'd rather do, you know? Um, a slightly self-indulgent question. Um... Did you ever have imposter syndrome when you moved into coaching as a career? You know, given you've come from hairdressing, you did film, um, and you talk about improving people's lives and all the rest of it. Have you always had that certainty, that self-belief? Or did you, did you ever suffer with imposter syndrome like a lot of people do? Well... Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I, I, I kind of wrote about years ago, I wrote an article addressing this issue and it was about kind of the five myths of coaching. And the big myth is that um, a coach has a perfect life. Like you hire someone because I have a perfect life. I have a really nice car, like all this stuff. Like that's what coaching is. 
So your coach has to be perfect or I have to be a CEO in order to coach, to coach a CEO. Yeah. So yes, there are times where everyone feels like an imposter. I would say if, if you don't feel like an imposter, you're a liar, <laughs> <laughs> especially when you have clients that you just, you know, some clients you just can't help. It doesn't work. The, the system just fails. Like it doesn't, you don't get any results that that happens. That tends to make you feel like an imposter, but overall, no. No, I, I never, I don't feel that way. I'm pretty confident and um, I don't know why, but I have a gift and I can help people get results if they're open and receptive and they want to come into the system and, and play full on. Um, and I don't take any responsibility for that. I, I, I feel like a good coach is like a prism and some sort of magic and light and information flows through this prism. and the coach and the client almost like there's this relationship that happens. Sometimes you don't know who's giving and who's receiving, but the transformation is happening. I don't, it's, it's miraculous. It's, I can't even take credit for it, mm -hmm. but I create the space for something to happen. And that's what coaching is really about. It's not about your coach has to have a perfect life. I don't have a perfect life. <laughs> you know, I was diagnosed with a life threatening illness a few years ago. So I, like everyone else, I've gone through incredible upheavals in my life. Um, you know, the first year I was a coach, I made $12,000. I mean, <laughs> you know, I barely could survive. So I'm not trying to sell people some shiny cotton candy story. Um, but for the most part, I don't feel like an imposter because I, I think this process isn't just about goal setting. <laughs> it's about becoming who you are truly capable of becoming. It's, it's accessing your own inner wisdom. And I just create a space for that to happen. You know, I'm a, I'm a willing participant in this very beautiful but mysterious process. Um, you know, so long-winded answer. I don't, I don't know if it answered it. No, it... It definitely did. Um, I, I like some of the words you use. Um, I can feel the storytelling and um, just the way you describe things. It's very visceral. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. Um, if, um, if people want to work with you, David, if they like what they've heard, what I guess the best thing for them to do is to go to your website, is it? Yeah, just my website and then it's very easy to just book a conversation on there and um, the calendar puts it into your time zone and it's all pretty straightforward. Yeah, that's the best way. You know, everything starts with a conversation and, um, you know, you can't sell coaching. You can only, you have to be ready and you have to sort of want to explore something. So, um, but I'm willing to give everyone you know, a half hour, an hour of my time to just have a conversation and, you know, if people feel called to do that. Um, even an introductory call is often, can be often quite liberating, you know? Yeah. It's, it's surprising what you can talk about in a half an hour, where, where you can get. Yeah. And what is your website? I mean, I'll put it in the show notes, but just so they can hear it. What's your website? Oh, it's davidfrankgomes.com. Okay, cool. All right. And, um, well, I think I love your chair, by the way, it looks like a race car chair, but you know what? It's actually my son's chair. This is not something that I would have chosen. Um, and yeah, it's like a gaming chair, but this was his office chair. He's just moved to Manchester. So he's left everything behind. Um, so I'm, I'm just, okay, uh, gaming chair, yeah, that yeah, this was his little office. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. okay. Well, I always like to sort of close off these conversations with whatever you feel drawn or called to share or um, any sort of pearls of wisdom you might have for anybody listening that might be, <laughs> hey, that might be thinking, you know, this coaching lark thought about it. Sounds good. Uh, I like the sound of David. Um, I'm maybe I'm at a crossroads where I'm not quite sure what the hell I'm going to do next. So anything you'd like to share? Well, um, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think, I guess what I'd like to leave people with is transformation is possible. It's a physical possibility. 
Um, it's not some pie in the sky promise or some uh, sort of hopeless ideal that no one reaches. Um, there's a recipe for a lot of this stuff. Uh, and, you know, what we practice day in and day out is how we wire our brain up. So your practices create your neurobiology. And so, you know, if you're feeling like you can't change or it's hopeless or something isn't the way you want, like seek out some support, invest in yourself, you know, whether with me or anybody. Um, Cause I've seen again and again, people can change mm. and they do change. And um, it's not some pie in the sky promise. And if you can find the right relationship, somebody you trust, you feel safe with, and you feel has the chops to take you where you want to go, invest in it. It's, it's, you know, can often be life changing. You know, that that's, that's what I'd say. And of course, I'm biased. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure you probably have had the same experience. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, um, for me, the coaching came around. I mean, I, I did psychology at, at uni and, and thought I was going to be a psychologist and then taught myself out of it and then ended up in sales for over 20 years. And um, I got into coaching last year, but it was probably, it's been three or four years permeating around. Um, like I said, late developer. Uh, and yeah, I, I've done quite a bit of coaching. I've been through coaching myself, so know that it works, know the power of it. Um, but like you said, you've got to be ready for it because if you're not, you're going to waste your money or get very frustrated with your coach. Probably, um, you've got to want to change. You've got to want to improve your life and you've got to, you've got to accept that the person you've been and the way you've been behaving needs to change. And I think sometimes that's a bit of a tough call for people. Um, so yeah. Yeah. The happiest people probably, they don't have perfect lives. They've, they've just become friendlier with the imperfectness. Like they, they start to be okay with how life is. And that's the essence of mindfulness is just starting to be friendlier with life, you know? And I, I think that's not something we're taught in school. No. So that's probably got to change. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, David. It's been a real pleasure to meet you. Um, I wish you all the best with your with your career. It sounds like you're doing extremely well. And um, yes, thank you again. And I know the listeners will have loved this. So thank you very much. Yeah, it's my pleasure, Mel. Thanks for inviting me on. I, I really appreciate it. No problem.